Mark here for Mark 2.0. Brian and I are just thrilled to interview our next guest, Ben Mio McRae, uh, actor, producer, director. Ben Mio, welcome to the podcast. Ben Mio, thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. We'd like to start out by talking about uh, Bullet Train. Ex explain Bullet Train. what your role was in there. N number one movie. Uh, yeah, Brad Pitt, David Lettich, um, a really, really fun project. Um, well, so many amazing cameos in that movie. I don't, you know, I don't want to uh, have any spoilers, but my character, uh, the cardiovascular surgeon, uh, is the most skilled surgeon in the world and, and is the only person that has the facility that can, can save uh, one of the key characters. Whether he does or not, uh, I'm not going to say, but you'll have to go see the movie and check it out. It's, it looks like a wild roller coaster. It, it, it really was. Um, it really is. I mean, it's a fun movie. It's definitely one of those get your popcorn, uh, you know, enjoy the, the ride because it does take you on a really great ride. I see a lot of Japanese lettering and stuff. Is that where it? Well, it's based, on, it's based on a novel, a Japanese novel. So, um, you know, there, there's some uh, um, talk about um, it maybe not being Japanese enough, but it does pay uh, great homage to the novel and it does take some license. And, you know, the performances uh, of, the, of the main cast are amazing. What year was that novel? Uh, I'm not actually sure what year the novel was, but it's hmm. not, that long, not that long ago. Where did it originate? Hmm? Where did that novel uh, originate? Uh, a Japanese writer. Oh, wow. Yeah, from Japan. Yeah. Okay, wow. Amazing, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it, that was a fun project. Uh, it's gonna be running for a while. It's doing really, really well. You know, open number one. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's doing really well. It's, and hopefully it's gonna stay at, at the top of the, top of the uh, screening for a while, you know? This is going to be great for you. This is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, I didn't get to work with with Brad or anyone. Uh, you know, my character was kind of like a, a B story, so to speak, but uh, definitely uh, a main plot point to the movie. Can you say if you're are you on the train or? Oh, I'm not on the train. Yeah, you're at the destination. Yes. Sort of. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you guys haven't seen it yet. You'll have to go check it out. Oh, we're planning Absolutely. on it. Yeah. I just found out you were in it. Yeah. I, I'm really kicking myself. I said, oh, I don't have time, but I, 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 maybe you can come back sometime, you know, and uh, well, I'll talk about how it did and I'm sure it's going to be great. I've, I've seen the trailer now and I can't wait to go in. Yeah. It, you know, I haven't been in the theaters very much myself since COVID um but you know this is a great excuse to kind of uh you know get back to some sense of normalcy i think you know now's a good time people are going back to the theater you know uh, top gun kind of proved that you know that people are hungry to get out and see movies. i miss it too yeah mm -hmm. i'm ready it's, a, it's an interesting time you know uh that that uh project was shot in, in the height of covid was one of the first uh, productions kind of to kind of uh, deal with filming uh, on, at, at, on that scale during COVID. You know, much of it is uh, was shot, I guess, on stage on a back on a back lot at Sony, um, and it was amazing the set that they they built for that. You know, the train set and um, the platform and everything, and so a lot of green screen work. Uh, you know, the visual effects these days are pretty remarkable what they're able to do. Um, and that is just kind of like a testament of, of, of that, you know, so. And all with the challenges of COVID. All with the challenge of COVID, you know, so everybody was masked up. Um, you know, it's very, I, going back to work at the beginning of COVID was really, um, challenging and weird you know like you uh, one of the first projects i was back on set this was one uh, and, uh 
did an episode of Good Trouble was another one. And I just remember, um, you know, have it, ha in the scene, having to shake hands with another person and that being so like, you know, awkward. Boring. Yeah. It, yeah. It was like, cause it, we went through this long, long period during COVID where, you know, you, you we were really worried. Have any physical, physical touch with anyone. And, uh, you know, so once you get past that, I mean, it, you know, it was it was, um, it was amazing to have um, interaction with people. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was I was really excited to be able to to have something to have a, a a job during COVID. You know, that was a great one, and. Um, you know, and now looking looking for the next thing. Um, was but, it you know, riddled I didn't do with it. delays because of COVID? Like, did someone get sick and you lose a month like that? Uh, those, those you know, that's happening quite a bit. And, and now with the new surge and, and whatnot, there's you know, uh, productions are definitely um, having to kind of deal with shutdowns and whatnot. You know, for for COVID and for you know just you know you have one actor that goes out or you have a crew person that goes out and it's kind of like a snowball effect you know um you know the, the tracing you have to do and uh, you know i i've always been very responsible during covid because i don't want to be the one that shuts things down you know um you know, have they lightened up a little bit lately it has it has been i mean but the guy you know the protocols and the the protocols are kind of strict, but the guidelines from CDC, you know, has definitely uh, been more lax as of late. And so it just makes it a little more confusing, you know, everybody trying to, to do the right thing. Um, but, you know, the, the protocols are still strict. Everybody's testing, you know, uh, I mean, if you're, if you're on set, you're testing pretty much every day, uh, you know. Hard to find that uh, line crew between are, not being careful and leading a normal life. Yeah, I mean, crew members are testing one to one to five times a week, mm -hmm. okay. and so it's all it's about prevention. You know, uh, catching things early so that everyone else is remains safe. Amen. What was yeah. it like to be on uh, two hit Amazon shows, The Terminal List and Bosch? You were really good in Bosch. I saw that episode that you did. Uh, great shows, you know. Uh, you know, Bosch was uh, was a was well, a series, but it, they shoot it very much like a film. It's a very cinematic uh, show, um, and you know what was really funny about that uh, uh, experience is that was kind of like a full circle moment from like the very beginning of my career, uh, starting out in New York, living in Hell's Kitchen. Um, I did an episode, what was it? It was, uh, maybe, I think it was New York Undercover. Wow, and, uh, I remember that show, yeah. Yeah, and so I was booked to to double uh, the actor Paul Calderon. Um, he was playing an assassin sniper on the show, and uh, I guess he he hadn't finished his some of his work, and they needed somebody to stand in, and... Um, uh, I ended up basically playing his finger in, in that episode of the show. And um, so come all these many moons later, I don't know, more than 20 years after that happened, we got to actually work together in that, that wow. show in, in Bosch. So that was kind of, that was kind of funny. Unreal. Yeah, it was really funny. Um, yeah, so I've been, I mean, that really, wow, that takes me back, you know, to my early days in New York. Um, uh, and then so Terminal List, Terminal List, uh, man, that's a, that's an action packed show. I have to okay. say that I was completely blown away by Terminal List. I started that thing and could not stop watching it until the very end. And I just, I mean, it was so emotional on me beginning to end you know with the vets and everything and just did you serve, did you serve? wow did I, no 
I did not. I did Family not. Family members that served? Yes, my father and grandfather. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a war time like they were, but I would if I needed yeah. to. Yeah, my uh, my uncle served uh, in Vietnam, and you know that's they made that's who they made the show for. They made the show for the for for, for the country for the people that served the, our country. Um, it's a very patriotic uh, portrayal. Uh, and, 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 and gutsy subject matter, might I add, saying that a government would actually follow through on such things. Very, very intense. Yeah, yeah. A lot of good surprises, you know, in, in, this, in the arc of that series. It'll be interesting to see what the new storylines will be when, when it comes back. Oh, back. Oh, sure. gosh. Uh, I'm palpitating. I can't wait. Bravo. Oh, it was great. I, you know, I got to work with Chris. Uh, he's very uh, kind uh, person, very giving, you know, person, very welcoming. It was, uh, you know, great to be on that set. Uh, and this is Ellen, Amazon. As Amazon, yeah. And uh, the director, Ellen Kuras, um, I had uh, worked with as a young person uh, on a Spike Lee movie going back. Wow. Well, 97 it's a long time ago so wow i a, like the chris uh, pratt that little plays little. a role that's serious and not cracking a lot of jokes just like in uh the tomorrow war very good very good because he backed away from all that you know that dark humor you know and just i i, I like the the good dad good soldiers side of of him and he really brought everybody in that whole in that whole thing was just awesome yeah, it's a great vehicle for 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 him, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing his character continue. So this is an important thing to him. Oh yeah, to I think to everybody on the sh on the show, you know, wow. everybody really put their heart and soul into making making that, that just show. Just makes it twice as cool for me. You know, Jack Carr, his history, and you know, uh, all the producers, Antoine Foucault, you know. Uh, the producers that worked on that show worked very hard uh, to be true in the accuracy of what they were doing. Um, and, you know, people have responded, you know, really favorably to it. Wow. Great. So, uh, David DiGilio, uh, you know, showrunner, did an amazing job. Um, you know, and again, it's going to be awesome uh, when the show comes back and see where they go with it. Definitely. Hopefully I get to work with those guys again. Oh, that would be great. We, we're looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you will. And you have directing and uh, producing experience, too. Explain that. I do. I, um, you know, I've directed some shorts, and I've also done some voice directing and animation um, okay. uh, in, in my past. But uh, the last two shorts, uh, I've... Uh, one called Retribution, uh, that was quite a while ago. That was at the beginning of Wendell Pierce's career okay. from The Lock from the Wire. Um, uh, he plays an older brother. It's, about, it's kind of a coming of age, about two brothers um, taking over the family business after the father passes. Um, emotional, moving story. Um, and that, that uh, premiered on Showtime uh, Quite a while ago, but that kind of got me um, started uh, behind the camera. Uh, and then most recently, uh, did a short called Aquarium, which was kind of a fish out of water story about two a couple who um, try to start over, and one decides that they don't want the same things. They go back to where they came from, uh, and that that. Did quite well. That was a micro short that started out at Slam Dance as a part of a competition, and then we ended up taking it to Cannes uh, and and around the festival circuit. It was quite 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 a lot of fun. I saw Slow Pulse. You were a co-producer of that one, weren't you? Yeah, Slow Pulse was uh, was recently. Um, Marshall Tyler um, uh, wrote and directed uh, this film. Uh, which uh, is also doing very well on the festival circuit. Um, 
about a father coping with uh, his son being in a coma. His son is a dancer. And um, in the short, the father kind of completes uh, the, one of the son's uh, dance routines um, uh, to kind of pay tribute to his son. And then uh, ultimately the son uh, comes out of the coma and have a happy ending. But that was a, that was a story that was really important to me having, well, it touched me quite a bit having had uh, some dance in my own background. Yeah. You know, um, I, I have a lot of dance uh, in my background starting in high school. I used to be, uh, uh, had a couple of ballet scholarships and did jazz. And then that continued actually through Syracuse. You know, I did musical theater. I was wow, doing musical a couple theater. scholarships. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah talk yeah. about yeah. that a little bit. I mean, that's, that covered some that's time, right? Nice. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, well, uh, there's two different uh, ballet companies, Philadelphia Civic Ballet Company, uh, wow. and another company in Syracuse. Um, uh, so I did a lot. I did a lot of dancing, and then uh, you know, uh, when I got to Syracuse, and uh, being in the musical theater department, you know, doing musicals, you know, in, in, in my history, you know, I've done West Side Story, and had had a great time. Uh, you know, main camera lot, and, you know, a lot of. That's awesome. I did a, I did a lot of musicals earlier in my in my youth, um, not so much uh, as a you know, my later years have kind of just focused on straight theater. But um, you know, while I was at school, you know, you know, funny Aaron Sorkin is a great writer, but you know, back in our school days, he was a song and dance fan. You know, hmm. um, you know he. Uh, yeah, Vanessa and, and um, our, you know, a lot of our classmates, we all were in dance class together. Um, you know, so it was, it was a great, or uh, it was a great training at Syracuse, you know, prepared me for New York. I went to, ultimately went to, to New York after that, and, you know, uh, did what most actors do, you know, beat the payment for, for work. And, How uh, old I, were you right around there? Well, that was right after college, so uh, 22-ish, yeah. You know, I was in New York for a while. I've kind of bounced back and forth uh, between coasts. You know, spent some time in New York, then I come to LA, then I go back to New York. And now here I am back in, in Los Angeles, but, you know, two great cities, you know. Uh, Absolutely. Yep. Now, now, as someone who's a fan of dance, uh, you obviously were a music fan growing up. What were your favorite, you know, musicians? My favorite musicians? That's a good question. I, mean, I like jazz. Um, I like, I mean, but I, I like rock too. I mean, if you talk about in my youth, I mean, it's like Earth, Wind & Fire. Oh, yeah. Donny Hathaway. You know, if you go towards the early days of rap, I think my first concert was Curtis Blow. Um, these are the breaks. You know, I love Prince. You know, I'm, I have a, a real eclectic um, taste in music. I kind of, I mean, I like pretty much all genres. Um, but I don't know if I actually have a, a favorite favorite. Oh, all right. Um, James Brown was amazing. Actually, James Brown came to Syracuse while I was there. Um, cool. He performed in a, a little small uh, venue on campus. And uh, when I say small, I was maybe, maybe it held a couple hundred people. It was very, very small. So like the stage was maybe 12 feet or something. It was really intimate. And so I got to to go to that show and it was the last show at that particular venue on campus before it closed. It had a, 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 a big long musical history similar to some of the, I would say Blue Note or Bitter End in, in New York would be kind of comparable. Um, this was called the Jabberwocky, was a, was a famous uh, small venue on campus. But Jay Brown came and I mean, it was a small venue, but it wasn't a small show. I mean, he mm. put the same energy uh, 
you know, the, into that show as he did any of his larger. I'm concerts. sure. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, that's, that, you know, I'll go to the jazz fest, different jazz festivals. Uh, well, seeing that show must have been just amazing. That's almost like unbelievable that, you know, they just slip out and do those nice little shows still. That's that's great. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So it's, been a, it's been a, a real interesting journey, you know, because I started, started the business so young. I actually started in high school. You know, growing up, growing up in Philly, um, you know, uh, which was kind of rough and tumble in in the in, in the early years, um, and one of you know our only outlets, my my sister and I was kind of like performing. We you know our first performance performing experiences were as part of our synagogue, you know. Um, they would take uh, Broadway musicals and change the lyrics to tell the story of Purim. These were Purim, Purim plays. Wow. Uh, and that's kind of how um, I got started. Though I had, a, I had a big brother, like a big brother program, who was a theater buff. And he's the one who actually introduced me to uh, professional theater. You know, my first play was a, was a, was a, uh, farce was Moliere's of the Miser at the Walnut Street Theater. Uh, saw that Were you at, on that one. I think I was 12, 12 or 13. Wow. I was pretty, pretty very young. Pretty, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty young. And that show blew my mind. You know, I, I don't think I had any um, thoughts of being an actor before that play, but after seeing that play, man, it was like, it was like magic, you know. You were like hooked, magic. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, good theater or good art in general uh, transports you. Sure does. It, 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 it was like a whole, you know, being in a whole other world. It's kind of, you know, if you're a scuba diver, that's something else I've had done, I've done in the past. But, you know, the first time you take a dive, and you're underwater and you're down there that's a whole nother world you know so it's really immersive so my first experience with the uh, theater was like that it was just very uh transformative transporting you know, it just really took me away and my imagination started to run run wild now so who's giving you the I'm, best who's giving you the best advice about acting and 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 doing these things I don't know about the best. Um, I've had a lot of great teachers along the way. Um, Guess that's the important thing. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, James Baldwin says the only-, the only Maybe I should say, what are the best lessons they gave you? Well, being true to your art, I was going to say James Baldwin always says said that you know the only responsibility an artist has is to actually do do the work is to do their own to do the art. Um, uh, you, I mean, you to be good, you have to really practice the, practice your craft, and it's a lifelong exploration. You know, you have to be to be a good actor. You have to be a good observer. I mean, a good artist. You have you're an observer of life, um, of experience. You know, observe behavior to be able to kind of translate that into the characters that you, you portray. Um, Margie Haber is a, a coach that you know I worked with. Uh, took class from. Uh, you know, and she talks about living the life. You know, uh, living the life, you know, uh, basically living the life of the character um, that you're portraying, uh, you know, being truthful to the, to the character you're portraying. And it, that takes, uh, again, observation and uh, practice. So you know what you're, 
your instrument is able to do, like a musician, you know, musician practices scales and whatnot, uh, practice their instrument, our instruments, our body. So um, you get your voice, you, you know, your physicality, um, you have emotion and all of those things um, come together to kind of create the art. Create Take the us art. on a journey into the audition process. Like you're auditioning for Criminal Minds, This Is Us, you name it. What is it like and what, what's the feeling like when you get the part? Well, as of late, it's changed a lot because, um, because of COVID, sure. a lot of casting starts virtually. Um, so you, you're, you're doing self tapes for a lot of, you know, you'll get an audition through your agent uh, initially for a self tape. And so you, you'll get the material, you print it out. Uh, you know, you work on it, you prepare it, and then when you're ready, you, you set up a camera and you do a self-tape. And this, I, I'm actually in my space that I do my self-tapes in right now. Um, uh, and so you, you send in the self-tape, and then from there, if you get a call back, then uh, it could be in person or it could be a Zoom session with a uh, producer and director. And it just kind of goes from there. So I, I haven't had that many uh, in person as of late, um, but it's starting to pick up more. You know? I've always had that old fashioned image of a room full of people and they all have a script in their hand, you know, and some guys going, you, 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 you. It's not like that at all anymore. Well, you know, you, it's a, usually there's a pre read. You know, so casting will bring you in, uh, they'll read a bunch of people, you know, I mean, you have, they go through, I don't know how many hundreds of pictures or whatnot to pick the, the pool of people that they're going to audition. They do a pre-read from there, you know, uh, they'll read that group and then whittle it down to who they're going to show, you know, bring to producers and directors the next level. And it just keeps on going from there depending on uh, how big the role is. Yeah. I'm amazed uh, by actually the, the broader spectrum of all of the entertainment. Now it's not just movie industries, there's Netflix studios, Amazon studios, and there's all of these, gosh, these, these series well, that just look as good as any movie. It's like movies are 10 hours long now, and it's just really amazing. Yeah, well, there's a lot of series now. I mean, that was that's been the big thing since streaming. You know, uh, oh, what was interesting about streaming is the Netflix and Amazon and uh, all the streamers that create Apple. You know, is also doing great con uh, original content. Yeah, um, it allowed uh, them to work directly with artists and directors and, and writers to create their own projects. Um, and so a lot of, a, a lot of talent that used to working in, in film and movies actually kind of jumped over to doing long form, you know, uh, series work. It's kind of changed the business quite a bit. Kind it's of interesting cutting out. Because, uh, it's, it's circling back. I mean, you know, it's, movies are, are far from dead, you know, it's, you go see Bullet Train in the theater. You go see Top Gun in the theater. It's a, it's a, it's a real experience, and it's and they're streaming the movies no, no, no. too, though, on like uh, Fire Stick or whatever. The new movies you pay nineteen ninety nine, you can watch it at home too. Yeah, you can pay. You can yeah pay 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 per view uh, at home for sure. But you know, again, it's you don't get the the same experience. You know, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna wait. So it's, you know, you, you, you have IMAX and all the other um, iterations uh, that make a lot, going to a movie theater worth it, you know, where the seats are moving and you have a screen that's as big as, uh, you know, floor to ceiling of this. Oh know, yeah, nothing like theater. IMAX. Now, yeah. be, let me ask you something about the streaming services because there's so many streaming services and, uh, you know, networks like USA and such. Doesn't that keep the studios open year round? Before, weren't that weren't they 
kind of a little bit dead in the summer. It must create work. a lot of more work too. I mean, there's. Uh, I mean, not this. I mean, they weren't necessarily dead. And it just uh, again, it's like the model has changed. You know, if you talk about um, network television, well, certainly that was like, you know, July to March, or you know, twenty-two shooting twenty-two episodes of something. Then uh, from March to you know the next phase, people would go from you know working on a series, a network series like that, to maybe working on a cable show, mm-hmm. and then going back to the long form series, or if you're on a show, you would, you know, you would have your 22 episodes, and then you'd have your break, but then you'd want to fill that in with a movie, you know? Oh yeah. That's okay. a good point. Try to, try to slot that into your schedule. And it's, and it's, and it's like, like, like that now, I mean, it's, you know, if you're a, a top talent and people are wanting to, you to work on their projects, then, you know, there, there's always a challenge schedule wise to try to, have things align where you can get the people that you want, you know. But if you're good, you, typically you're kind of slated, you're spoken for for X number of time or however long the projects are that you work on. Now, what about like short films? Point. Well, I wanted to ask you about short films because you've done a lot of short films. And what's great about you is a lot of your short films are available on YouTube. And, you know, it's cool because, like you're saying, it's like the artist is kind of breaking away from things and doing things on their own. So, yeah, please talk about your short films. Well, short film works are, is great because, you, well, one, you get to work with uh, colleagues that you want to work with. Uh, you get to work on uh, uh, pet projects. You get to... Um, work out ideas that may turn into other other things, you know. Uh, so, I mean, that's the benefit of, of a short film. Uh, uh, and I've done, I've, I've worked with a group called Make a Film Foundation, where they help uh, at-risk uh, and terminal youth create film legacies, um, where the kids uh, basically write write their projects and then they have professional crew and cast work on them so um, yeah. and you, you know you'll you'll have you know like Johnny Depp worked on uh, one of those projects Kerry Washington you know, get a lot of um, a lot of people that want to get back to work on projects like that so you know it's great to make money on the mainstream projects, but you know, people invariably want to work on other things when they can, whether it's theater, you know, uh, theater is always great to go back to, or these, you know, these love, um, you know, people, you know, the projects that people just do because there's meaning to it um, and it touches uh, and it gives back. I feel like short films really go there too. One that stood out for me that you did was Zero. Explain that short film. Um, Well, uh, Zero, you know, I played a cop in that. Uh, That was kind of, it was a futuristic uh, story. David Vittori was the writer, director. Um, uh, Man, that was a while ago. What can I say about that one? Uh, I think that was a project that might have uh, eventually become something uh, larger, but it it, it, did, it actually didn't. Oh, okay. Uh, it was produced by Ridley Scott. He was a producer on it. Um, Mark Vittori, uh, a young filmmaker. Um, you know, basically not much, got a shot. Not much bigger names than Ridley Scott. <laughs> oh That's, yeah, that probably will do something one day. How long ago was that? Well, I mean, it was good for the filmmaker, you know, and again, uh, oh, yeah. it, it, as, a, as a short project, it's a testing ground, you know, for them to, you know, prove their mettle to, to get to do other, other things. So hopefully he's gone on to, to make bigger, bigger stuff. Very cool. Yeah, I, it was just unreal to see because, uh, you know, no gravity. 
how they took away the gravity in it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Was, you haven't really seen that. Well, it's, uh, it's po- apocalyptic, you know. Uh, so that, that was a really, really interesting project. Yeah. Well, there was the, the other one that you played the boss on, the voice in your head. Yep. Yep. Again, all of the all of these projects that was, you know, that went to South by Southwest. Um, a chance to work with another um, talented up and comer. Uh, you know, that was a chance to do comedy. So that was fun to work on uh, something that was very much in the vein of the office. Um, and again, so that's a late, you know, all of these projects are kind of more labor, labors of love, you know. Uh, some, some of them really draw in some big name talent, mostly because of uh, the people who are behind it. Like, so even, it's interesting, in Bullet Train, David Ledich is the director. David's background uh, is in stunts. He was a stunt man. He was Brad Pitt's stunt double. What? He did all of, all of Brad Pitt's stunts for many, many, many years. And so, um, that's a fun fact. Yeah, and so actually, it was, I mean, there's a lot of stunt people kind of crossing over into in, into directing. But you know, it was interesting. And if you, I think there's some some interviews and things you can listen to them talk about it, uh, their experiences together. But there's an instance where you have someone talented uh, newcomer, you know, David, uh, he's not so new now, you know, but he's, he's had a, a, a great run with his, his films because he's proved that he can direct action well, but that's, a, that's in his wheelhouse, right? So, uh, but then he can call Brad Pitt and say, would you be in my movie? Right. Yeah. So, it's, wow. it, and, and then, so for Brad, it must be, you know, it must have been really um, fun to kind of uh, be able to, to work with him on that level, um, change, flip the relationship a little bit. <laughs> watching the trailer friends. you can really see um, and i'm sure brian will agree that brad really enjoyed uh doing this movie yeah um i know he did most of his stunts uh and again so it's an action movie you have a director who has a stunt background uh and uh, so you know the action is going to be good he had a great stunt team yeah you know greg Rementer was uh, uh was the guy in charge of stunts, stunt coordinator. I got to work with Greg uh, on my scene. You know, I had to uh, fall in, 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 in the scene. So I had a little bit of rehearsal with, with him on set. Uh, and I've done a little bit of stunt work actually in the past, um, but from time to time. Yeah. Going back to my early days, I did some stunt doubling Meshach Taylor. Um, those bet bullet train they probably have the tiny little tubular sets you know basically you know probably really small kind of challenging in a small area to do all those fighting scenes yeah they talk about yeah they talk they, i've heard them talk about the challenges of, of being in a small space of creating action for a small space you know it, it definitely has its challenges but they did an amazing job you know Whips you really great even if you haven't seen the movie, you can see the trailer and you can kind of see, you know, uh, how they kind of dealt with those. Yeah, we'll make sure to post the trailer in our uh, oh, description. Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. But yeah, I'm sure everybody's going to have seen it. I mean, it's number one. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. Now, yeah. one other thing that we didn't talk about you is that you enjoy to travel. What are some of the best countries that you've been to? Well, I mean, I, starting out in France, uh, you know, being at Cannes is, was amazing. Uh, you know, I, I'm a city kid, you know, growing up in Philly, I'm very, you know, at home in almost any major city. So I love Rome, I love Paris, you know, Amsterdam, London, 
you know, major metropolitan cities I'm, I'm really uh, at, at ease in. But, um, you know, those, those cities are kind of highlight cities. Uh, Rome, especially, the food and, you know, everywhere you look in Rome, the Colosseum, everywhere you look is a postcard, you know, that history, it's like, like nowhere else really, you know. Sounds like I, you've seen I, quite a bit. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I backpacked around um, Eastern Europe as a, you know, uh, as a younger person, you know, starting uh, in Amsterdam and kind of going down through France and Italy and uh, ferrying over to Croatia, Hungary, wow. and Poland, and Czech Republic. Very cool. Um, Eastern Europe. I haven't been to Japan. I haven't been to any Asian countries yet. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, Korea, Japan, uh, you know, uh, you know all, any, pretty much any of the Asian countries I, is still on my list. I haven't, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I've been to Vietnam twice and it just blew my mind. It's, it's unreal, you know, because they have their culture, but they also have a lot of Americanized, at least in uh, Saigon a lot yeah. of the American places it was it's really it has become a you know major city yeah I mean it, uh, uh, Americans are retiring to a lot of these places you know uh, Vietnam Belize um, you know Mexico uh, we're, we're kind of going everywhere Port Portugal is another Oh, spot. sure. That makes sense. Madonna went to Portugal. Yeah, I mean, it, the world is your oyster, you know, so there's nothing like uh, travel to open up your mind and to kind of experience other cultures. Is there anything else you're involved in or passionate about a charity, an organization or something that you get involved in that you'd like to talk about? Uh, Make a Film Foundation is one that I always um, talk about. Uh, Tamika Lamison is uh, uh, in charge of that that group, uh, so that that's one I've worked with quite a bit over, over the years. Um, uh, my wife worked with a group called uh, She Sees, which is an, another group that works with um, uh, girls to to teach filmmaking, mm. and. Um, you know, I volunteered in the past big bro as a big brother, hmm. you know, having, having had a, a big brother growing up uh, and, you know, uh, growing up without a father and being, you know, just having uh, my mom, you know, yeah. kind of raised me. I can, you know, appreciate uh, being able to, to uh, have that kind of a relationship. Um, you know, with the young person. Uh, what a great organization. It's, it's stood the, you know, the test of time. What a great thing it's always been. Yeah. Yeah. And I, ha I had experienced myself through uh, working when I lived in Chicago. I was with the Boys and Girls Club, but then I transitioned over to the Chicago Youth Center. And it was unreal because I could mentor a kid, take him out. And he, this is someone who had no parents in his life on the south side of Chicago. And his grandma was in a wheelchair was taking care of him. So they really didn't have much resources, but I'd be able to take them to a game or, you know, take them yeah, out to the arcade. And yeah. it was great, you know, help them with their homework, go go to the center every Wednesday and help them with their homework. And it's just a great experience. Yeah, yeah, it's very rewarding. And you just never know uh, the impact that you're, that you're having, you know, you know, on another sure. life. So, yeah. You know. Well, I'm just amazed at uh, everything you've done. What a great, great uh, experience this has been. Do you want to talk about what you're working on now at all or uh, up, and, up and coming some things? At the moment, I don't have a secret thing coming. Uh, I've been working with a group called The Braid, which is a theater group that used to be the Women's Jewish Theater mm. um, uh, and doing some theater work with them. Uh, and what city have, is that in? Here in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Very Angeles. cool. But I don't. I'm not sure the uh, the lineage of them. I think they started out in New York and now they're based here. Yeah. Um, but they 
they take uh, live story, they take stories uh, through a Jewish lens and um, it's kind of like a salon, it's a salon theater. So kind of like what maybe Anna DeVere Smith does and the way she brings people to life, real life people by telling their stories through a, a portrayal you know, in, a, in an intimate setting, that's kind of like a salon theater um, experience. Similar to that is kind of the work that they do. So, wow, I bet you yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, so that's, we, uh, the first time I worked with them was uh, for Pride this year. And uh, uh, we did a production called Out Loud. And so it was a series of stories uh, you know, LGBTQ uh, Jewish stories uh, that we did for during Pride Month, and that was great. That is nice. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast, Ben Mio. Brian, hey, pleasure to be here. Yeah, Ben Mio, it was really great having you, and and congratulations on Bullet Train. I mean. Uh, they probably are talking to you about a second movie, aren't they? <laughs> I hope so. It'd be great to work with, with those guys again. And uh, hopefully I get to do Terminalist again this year. Oh, I really I'm like so that. looking forward to that. And thank you for the good news that there's going to be more. I mean, I was just, it, it seemed like the story wrapped up nicely and I didn't expect that. That was a, an amazing surprise for me today. Right. Well, they haven't announced anything yet, but, you know, my fingers are crossed is that we're, we're, we're going to learn something positive too. all right well you heard it here first terminal list the next season it's coming ben Mio, thank McCray. you so much it's been great we're looking it's for you to great. blow up in the future we really you know think you're very talented we respect what you've accomplished thanks so much i'll be happy to come back all right Excellent. we hope to have you soon thank sure. you everybody uh for being here please subscribe and ring the bell to the video audience and everybody thank you so much and please join us for the next mark 2.0 podcast See you, everybody. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Ben.